Welcome to Upwell, the podcast. I'm Sarah, and this is my beautiful co-host, Katie. As fellow female entrepreneurs turned friends and now business partners, we are so happy you're here. With every episode, it is our sole purpose to share authentic conversations to inspire your personal level up. Take our curiosity at your best intentions and flow with us in the Upwell. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Upload the Podcast. I am Katie, and this is my girl, Sarah. We are super happy to have you guys back today. We have a very special guest. Yes, we do. We have Dr. Vincent Esposito. He's a holistic medicine doctor with a background in chiropractic, nutrition, and herbal medicine, who teaches mind-body medicine, the importance of nutrition, and circadian health. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I am excited to be here. Awesome. We are pumped to have you. I've been a follower of Dr. Vince for quite a while now because (laughs) it's funny and I'm going to have you share a a little bit more about your story, but we are very paralleled in how we got into the wellness space and the industry um, of holistic health. So tell us a little bit more about who you are, where you're from, how you got into what you do, and tell us some of your background and your expertise. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I I didn't really have any like health problems until I went to college. So, and, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Uh, but for me, what happened was I was, I went to college to, and I was playing a sport while I was there and I was always into like kind of fitness or perform the performance end of things. Cause I always played sports, played multiple sports in high school and then in college. But, um, you know, I always looked at it from like the performance aspect, mostly because I didn't have too many health problems at the time. Fast forward, uh, I would say probably between like my first like 12 to 18 months of college, I ended up putting on like 25 pounds, like 25, 30 pounds, which at the time I figured like I was lifting more, whatever. It's all muscle mass, you know, in my infinite wisdom at the time. Uh, but other like weird things came up. Like I had digestive issues that I'd never really had before, especially more like on the constipation side of things. I just never had that problem. Um, I developed seasonal allergies, never had allergies as a kid. Um, brain fog, fatigue. I never drank coffee until I went to college and being someone who was always kind of uh, up early Uh, that was a big deal for me. Like I took all morning classes and all that type of stuff. So like not having that kind of energy in the morning did affect me. And, you know, like I wasn't the only one. So, you know, we'd sit down and kind of like joke about it, but I'd hear a joint pain was another big thing. And, you know, we'd sit down and I'd hear like all these other people who are like, you know, 19, 20 years old who are like, Oh yeah, you know, I have this, I have that. I never had this before. And, you know, there'd be like passing comments about like getting older, which like now, you know, like a decade later is preposterous to think like you're 20 years old. It's like, oh, I'm breaking down. I'm falling apart, whatever. Um, But uh, while I was in school, I worked actually as an assistant trainer to the head strength and conditioning coach. So and I part of what I was doing was helping kids who were rehabbing by coming off injury in other sports so i wouldn't work with my own team but i'd work with the other teams and i kind of liked it so it got me it pushed me to a, and i knew i didn't want to go to medical school because i wanted to do something that was a little bit more hands-on so that kind of led me more towards like going to pt or chiropractic school ended up going to chiropractic school with the intent of going just into sports medicine uh but i went into school had a lot of these same health issues that kind of followed me there And it wasn't until my second year, I ended up taking biochemistry as part of the curriculum. And it was taught by a naturopath. And she just kind of taught it in a way that registered a lot differently than it did when I took it in undergrad. And the school I went to happened to have a nutrition program. So I ended up taking both at the same time. And about a year or so before I was going to graduate both programs, I decided, all right, it's time to start like kind of acting on some of the stuff I'm learning. And it wasn't just what I was learning in class. I started doing some reading on my own and stuff, but I'm like, all right, like I have some of this regular lifestyle stuff kind of tailored. Like my workout regimen was basically the same. My sleep schedule was basically the same. And I was always kind of good about that. So I started changing a lot of what I was eating. And like within, I'd say like two months, 
a lot of the other symptoms I mentioned, like the brain fog, the fatigue, the digestive problems, et cetera, kind of all went away. I would say within like six months or so, uh, all the weight kind of came off and this was not, you know, calorie counting or any of, you know, the bro science that, you know, I learned back like before that. And I was like, oh, wow, like there's something to this. And basically by the time I was getting close to graduating and I already had kind of like something part-time because I knew I wanted to do something on my own too. I was like, you know what? The sports medicine stuff and rehab stuff is cool, but like if it's just like some education and, and, and can teach, like anyone should be able to do what I just did. And to me, like that to me was a lot more powerful than helping someone rehab. Not that you don't need those people, but to me, it just kind of resonated with me, with me more. And that's kind of just kind of took it and ran with it for however long it's been five, six years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I love all of that because I think, there's something so powerful about natural healing modalities. And you can tell like when you start learning about it, it's just so interesting. And then you start to experience it yourself, mm -hmm. you know, by implementing some of the things that you did and some of the small changes that you made and you saw the impact it made on your life. So it's like, you know, once you feel that and see that yourself, it, it makes it so much more enjoyable, I guess, to want to pursue that as a career or help other people kind of recognize the th same things that you did in the process. So I love hearing that. Yeah. I mean, to me, that that's most of the fun of it. Like even now, you know, there's always new things that like I'm trying to learn or build on, or even if it like, what I've learned is like most at this point, like most of the general, like recommendations don't really change, but like the understanding as to why they happen change or i guess grow <laughs> evolve for sure and and to me like i i'm always fascinated by like how generally speaking it, a lot of this stuff is really simple it might mm -hmm. not be easy but it's simple um and to me i i don't know there's something like poetic about that <laughs> it's always a matter of picking your hard like picking exactly picking what type of hard that you want to do you like you said it might not be easy but it's simple but it you know it's it's picking your heart it's hard to to let your body go down the drain but it's also hard to keep your body in shape but both of them are pretty easy to do and it's just it's a matter of picking which one totally and, and i think the biggest kind of disconnect we're at now and i mean even like the ability to do this podcast i mean we're, we're experiencing like the double-edged sword to, that is technology mm -hmm. um which again is great in so many ways but i i think what we're seeing and what we have seen i'd say probably for the it's at least my lifetime because i grew up uh you know i didn't have a cell phone i want to say till i was in like seventh or eighth grade and it was like that nokia brick phone so it wasn't like anything <laughs> that like we have now i see like seven-year-olds with iphones right. um and, and to me it's like we're trading convenience at the cost, but it's at a cost or we're trade we're getting convenience but it's at a cost of something and it's in so many ways our health mm -hmm. and unfortunately like the model we're in right now just kind of perpetuates that because it, it kind of yeah. get the idea is you know, oh, this is a problem. Just take this. And it's just like, it, it's very passive in nature. And, and, and to me, I certainly have a bias more towards more active things like participating in your own healing. Yeah, we're very much advocates for being your own advocate. We, you know, that's something that we talk about and encourage all the time is, you know, teaching people or showing people how to be their own advocate when it comes to their body and their health. Mm -hmm. And taking personal responsibility. And I think that's such a big key in what you talk about a lot, you know, on all of your live streams, on your website, on your podcast interviews, you know, anytime I've seen you or heard you talking, it was really the main message is you have the power, you have the control. These are the things, you know, get back to nature, get back to simplicity. Like you said, not easy, but simplicity and using the things that are natural to humans to empower your health and to feel your best. So the reason, you know, one of the big things that I was so attracted to your message and what you share is the power of circadian health or, you know, using the sun and nature and our natural circadian hormones and rhythm to help us feel our very best. So tell us a little bit more about, 
you know, what circadian rhythm is. I know people hear it all the time and maybe they don't really recognize that it's anything other than just the sun rising and the sun setting. Um, so tell us a little bit about the correlation between circadian rhythm and our health. Yeah. So I want to think of like how, so again, just I could explain a little bit like my filter because I think everyone is going to have their biases and, and you'll see it on the internet because you'll see what happens is they'll say like, Oh, I'm evidence-based or Oh, the science shows this, which is great, but it's really through a filter that is mostly emotional. And we mostly make emotional decisions, generally speaking, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. 90 to 95% of the decisions we make are emotional, even if we want to hide behind, you know, a study supporting something. Now, my filter, and I want to, because I want to be open with my bias out front, is we live in a world now where we have random control trials that, is, that essentially dictate the religion of science, which for sure has its application in certain things, but there are limits to it. It, it can't mm -hmm. cover everything. Nature in and of itself does not adhere to the random control trial reductionistic world that mm -hmm. we want to ascribe to it. So my reason I'm saying all this is the reason for this is one of my guiding lights is if you see something happening in nature, usually it's going to be another species, a wild animal, something that ideally is not interrupted mm -hmm. by, by human interaction I, as much as possible. Um, those things are probably more co are correct or in line with health. It's just a quite, it's our job to figure out why not to create loopholes around it. We tend to do the latter. So to circadian health, this is important because as before, you know, the 1870s, when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, the only sources of light ever were the sun, the moon, and then you could argue there were fires. And that's it. There was, there was there was nothing else. So we didn't work on the schedules we work on now. You literally could not burn the candle at both ends because there were not candles for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now we have them. They're just in the ceiling. They're lights. Right. Uh, but that just wasn't available. So we had these kind of natural rhythms where we would align our days with the rise and fall of the sun and moon. We call it daylight savings. That literally happened because farmers were, were adjusting their days to that and the government ended up kind of playing a role in that and that becomes a whole thing. But point is like we, up until really about 120, 30 years ago, like our days were dictated by the sun and moon cycles more so than just what the clock says because you can only do certain things at certain times of day. Mm -hmm. In nature, obviously, that generally happens too. That most mammals, at least, like they're going to be awake during the day and they're going to kind of, you know, hibernate at night, depending on, you know, where they go, they go to different places. What's happened though, especially in, in the past, I would say probably since like World War II ish, we've really gotten into getting into fluorescent lights and creating a light environment that is not natural that, that that we're exposed to effectively all the time now especially the last 20 years this has been mm -hmm. effectively put on steroids with the advent of led computer screens um you know led light bulbs uh white light bright lights at night cell phones like all of this mm -hmm. stuff it, it, it are things we're exposed to on a regular basis and and we don't take into account that these things actually disrupt uh disrupt us down even below like cellular levels in terms of if we want to get down to that and unfortunately like i think it's something that is really overlooked and i don't think we're taking the dramatic potential like negative effects of this because it's usually not something that happens immediately now there are certain things you can notice short term but we're not going to see the long, the, the long-term ones of it. Like even with sleep, for example, like if you know, being on a phone, for example, after dark, after the sun goes down, that, that light exposure, especially from a screen that's around like 
5,500 Kelvins, which is effectively what the sun is at, at solar noon. So when the sun's at its highest, you're effectively getting in signals that are saying, hey, it's noon right now. So that's going to disrupt what you would imagine your melatonin cycles, your ability to rest, digest, and repair, all, and, and detox. All of that stuff happens while you sleep. So if you're disrupting that cycle, it's going. you're going to see the back end of that. And, and over time, there's just so many negative just impacts from that. It's, it's really hard to keep count of them. Yeah. Well, and like you said, though, when you were talking about melatonin, I mean, really everything that happens good or bad in our body is controlled by hormones, if I'm not mistaken. So like just overlooking the sleep hormones, especially, I think, like you said, can lead to so many down the line problems. And it's just not something that I think people put a big emphasis on, you know, they don't necessarily look at their sleep or if they're getting sunlight, you know, on their skin, in their eyes, in the early parts of the day. So I think that's just a big missing puzzle piece for a lot of people in their overall health. And I just, I kind of want to know from your perspective as a more like a naturopathic, you know, holistic side of medicine, why do you think that's overlooked or why do you think it's not common medical knowledge for doctors and patients. So what I'm, and you know what, if you asked me this question like six months ago, I'd probably give you a different answer. But what I have kind of been on the rabbit hole or going down, gone down the rabbit hole more recently on is when you mentioned hormones kind of running the show in a lot of ways, I think that's the effect. I would say the cause more so is going to be light and water environments in the body. Because what what I think the disconnect is, and I was talking to a friend about this maybe like a couple of weeks ago, is me as a doctor, other doctors, generally speaking, we're trained in biology and chemistry and not so much in physics and what, and really like you, you've probably seen the meme, right? Like bio, biology is just applied. Chemistry is just applied. Physics is just applied math effectively. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of like the, the joke of it, but what, for, maybe it's a joke for some people. I think it's a joke, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I'm learning is that in so many ways, light is a controller of a lot of this. And when we mention hormones, hormones kind of, they have much more far reaching effects on the body, but in terms of the ability to move, they're generally a lot slower than say nerves. And I would argue that we have another system and this is a whole separate concept probably for another podcast, but part of it's going to be talking about, uh, water in your body is not the same that kind of looks like this water it's more of a gel like liquid crystal structure and it actually interacts with light that can then travel electron these electrons can actually travel at the speed of light and the reason why this is important is nervous tissue nerves send signals that roughly around somewhere between 50 to 70 meters per second speed of light if you remember from you know physics class in high school is somewhere like three times 10 to the eighth So that's 300 million meters a second. That's a lot faster. So Mm -hmm. you can initiate, I think, a lot of these changes much more fat, much more quickly with light. And what some doctors have even found going back to like the 50s, and this is what a lot of people even talk about in like traditional Chinese medicine. They understood like energy. Obviously, there's acupuncture and there have been doctors who have actually outlined and traced the meridian system. So they understand this. Uh, the issues that they have is that they actually kind of dissipate in dead tissue, which is what most people do these kind of research on, but in they, they've done it on living animals and living people, and you could actually see it. And the doctor's name's escaping me, but there are some of the studies that were in like the eighties, but slight tangent. I think it's important that, w- that this light part is, is so important and Most people just simply don't understand it, even in my realm, because we don't have the training in physics and and the real people who like you can have these conversations with and they get it more are people like electrical engineers, uh, people in the physics field, obviously, but generally they're going to be like engineering type folks. 
and they tend to kind of get some of this stuff a bit more and understand the potential downstream ramifications whereas biology and chemistry are going to be a little bit slower to that game uh and it's just because we're not taught it yeah and i want to i want to quote a good friend of ours <laughs> dr bradley campbell says it all the time but logic is fast and science is slow and that's so true in this in this case and really so many it's like look at nature, you know, mm -hmm. really pay attention to what's natural and what's naturally occurring, you know, for other animals and on the planet. And, you know, maybe don't put so much weight in those studies, you know, that come out and so much trust, mm -hmm. I guess, in all of the the numbers and, and the things that are trying to play catch up essentially to what we already know to be natural. So yeah, I, I think that's a really good part. Again, I think there's a place for it, but you have to understand that there's just limitations to it. And that part, I think, that's where it becomes a religion, almost. Um, and, and it's ironic that, you know, everything's you talk about like faith being involved or you believe something. Well, you're believing in a model that we know does not incorporate everything. And I don't think any model will, but we just have to like accept that and be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So tell us, we, I want to know more about light health as you, as you are calling it and just talk about maybe some of those ramifications, you know, what are some things that people can look for that could potentially be a downstream effect of an imbalance in their circadian, you know, not enough daytime light or too much light by artificial sources in the evening. What are some things that maybe um, they would see in their health? and effects that they could feel oh it, it's going to range the entire gamut of what we see today um and i'm talking everything from like metabolic type of things whether we're talking about diabetes or heart disease which we could talk about them being diseases maybe but be that as it may some something going on with that to anxiety mood disorder type uh types of things to even all the way things to like gut issues um so one thing i was actually just reading uh yesterday is uvb radiation alone can actually alter gut microbiome diversity that's it just light exposure alone can do that and uvb for those who don't know is the light that most people will tell you causes skin cancer ironically what you'll see with a lot of those skin cancers is they end up occurring in places that usually don't get a lot of sun to begin with and that's a whole separate rabbit hole. But usually to me, that's like a mismatch. So so it could be every all the way down to like metabolic type issues. Usually they're going to affect the mitochondria in some way. And anything that's going to affect the mitochondria, it, it's, depending on where it is in its, um, or like in those stages, is going to affect most of the chronic diseases that we deal with today. And it's funny because like up until... I would say like the turn of the 20th century, like things like heart disease and diabetes, like did not exist. Didn't exist. It, it, it was not a thing. So we have to like ask ourselves, like, you know, is it these bad genes that, that we allegedly all have, or, or are we actually doing something that's affecting our environment? And are we asking the right questions to get to those answers? And more often than not, the answer is no, especially to the second part of that. So it could have really far reaching effects. It's not just about your sleep. Now, if your sleep is poor, it's going to also affect all of those things. So it's not like it's one thing. It's just how do they all kind of coalesce together? And you can certainly tie it back depending on the mechanism, depending on the person's situation and what's going on. Like uh, there was a post I did maybe like a couple months ago. Uh, again, blue light exposure alone can raise your blood sugar levels. I didn't learn that in school. Uh, you know, it, I also saw the flip side that just getting, they used a red light in, in the red wavelength. And I forget the exact light. I want to say it was like 680 nanometers, but don't quote me on that. Um, they just put a, a red light on someone's back for like 15 minutes per day for, and I think they tracked them over a month and they saw a 28% decrease in, in blood glucose levels. Mm -hmm not changing anything else didn't change what they ate they were just kind of doing what they were doing and and they compared it compared it to a sham uh and obviously the placebo did not have that effect so 
you know, we have to ask ourselves, like, what is really going on here? And like, what are the mismatches? Um, and, and again, I think the light stuff is very, it seems etheric because it's something most of us can't see. Uh, I mean, obviously we could see colors in the visible wavelength, but, but the visible spectrum is very tiny on the grand screen of, scheme of things. Yeah, I was actually, it's kind of funny that you actually just brought that up because my question was going to be, um, what were your, you know, thought processes on blue and red light therapy? And then you, you, what you went right into it. Um, but red light therapy has been shown to have so many health benefits and then the decrease in the blue light, you know, which is what everybody is constantly getting with their phone. The, the, the blue light that is radiated off of that. Um, now, do you find that, the 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 actual glasses that people can wear for to block the blue light is that of any benefit for anybody do you know what i'm talking about the um yeah so the blue the blockers glasses that people can wear does that is that beneficial at all or is that kind of just like a putting a band-aid on a problem so yes is the short answer but <laughs> but you know, it, it's all going to be contextual, right? So Correct. especially at night, if we, if you want to talk about like best practices, and we could certainly go further into the blue and red, uh, and I'm, like we could certainly circle back to that. But as far as best practices, blue blockers, I personally own them. So I'll put them on effectively after sundown, uh, especially okay. if I'm home. Uh, and that's irrespective of, of lights being on or not. Now, in an ideal circumstance, so about ideal, take everything out of the picture. When the sun goes down, effectively, all the lights should come off in your house. Now, I'm well, I'm aware that's not going to happen for most people. So, you know, like what are the next best things you could do? Ideally, I would have lights that are below eye level would be a good place to start. And I would want them dimmer and or in like the redder or orange spectrum. So some people will use like salt lamps, for example, because they tend or, or something in that spectrum. I've seen some people literally travel with uh, like red light bulbs to hotels and they'll like unscrew one of them <laughs> from like a lamp in a hotel room. Uh, because a lot of those are going to get, you're going to get that full wave, full spectrum. And when you're getting that full spectrum, you have to realize your eyes are telling your brain it's daytime. So that is going to, mm -hmm. to affect your cycles. Now, what the blockers do is they will filter some of that. Now, obviously glasses, they don't cover your entire spectrum. Like right. I can see out of the sides. So there's always going to be some getting in. Um, is it better than wearing nothing? Yes, they are. And again, like control the things you can control like i understand maybe some people might have to be on screens at night i would turn the red filters on all the way up but i would still wear the blockers because the backlight on your phone is still white so even if you turn it all red you can't shut it off completely the blockers can mm -hmm. still help with that mm -hmm. um and i would try to do it on as dim a setting as you can now phones and stuff like that like you shouldn't need at all ideally at night so you know, doing things that are a little bit more less tech reliant would be great. So writing, reading, um, you could do meditations, you could do yoga. I mean, I, I really don't care. You could actually talk with someone you live with. I mean, that's a wild concept. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, like th there's a lot of things you can do board games. I mean, and you could use like, you know, a, a dim lamp or a red lamp or something like you don't need like all the overhead lights on all the time. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of like little practical things you can do. Um, some <laughs> things you could certainly do more than others. Like I'm from New York city. So I get a lot of people rent. They probably can't change their lighting. Okay, great. Like you can get a lamp though. You can like, you can do other mm -hmm. things. Um, I just ordered, for example, like a red uh, reading light. So I don't need to keep my lights on in the room. So like there's little things you can do to, to kind of, create a better environment, especially as the sun, well, after the sun goes down. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause that kind of leads me to the next point mm -hmm. is I really just want, if, if this concept was brand new to someone watching and they are like, you know what, I want to pay more attention to, you know, my health and utilize some of the things that you're talking about with light and, and darkness and circadian patterns. 
what are some things outside of blue blockers at night and red light therapy that people can do to improve their overall health and start to see some, some benefits, you know, in different areas, like you said, everything from neurological things and anxiety and depression all the way through, you know, gut dysbiosis issues and even bigger chronic illnesses like diabetes and things like that. Yeah. So the first thing, and this is blanket across the board, is I would say you would have to get up every day before the sunrise and get outside and see the sun. And that is without glasses, that is without contacts, that is without sunglasses. So so naked eyes, if you will. Um, one of the reasons for that is that is going to be the strongest tool you have in your disposal to reset your circadian rhythm. So mm -hmm. seeing the sunrise is going to set the triggers throughout the day to say like, okay, now's the morning. We have more light. We have different lights coming in as the sun comes up and then they mm -hmm. kind of slowly taper off again as, as the sun goes down exactly mm -hmm. after solar noon. But that first infrared that you're going to get as soon as the sun breaks the horizon and obviously those reds and yellows, that's why you see that at sunrise and sunset is because the blue light comes closer to the sun getting towards its peak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or the UV, I should say, but, mm -hmm. and the blues too. But that's that trigger to kind of build that. And that does a lot of things from A, if you, and ideally, depending on where you live, I would maximize your, your skin exposure. So, <laughs> you, you know, like it's okay to take off your clothes if you can. And, and, and like, really, because that's going to make the biggest difference <laughs> uh, for a few reasons. Because one, if we're always focused on getting sunburned all the time, you know, one of the best ways to prime the body for that is to actually get the infrared in the morning, because part of that is a signal, hey, the sun's going to get stronger later in the day. Uh, and doing that with a naked eye. And exactly. Doing it with the eye, but the skin is also a receptor. So the more skin, and you, again, if you go back to nature, there's no other species on this planet that wears clothes last time I checked. So again, another thing we're thinking about, see, like, it's funny for me to say that, but it's just, a, it's just relative to modern life. Like it, that's mm -hmm. all it is. So maximizing skin exposure. And ideally, obviously I get it. You might have neighbors, whatever, but like, you know, within it, whatever you could do decently, put it that way um you know in the cold it's the winter near me yeah like i'll have you know a jacket on or something but it's better than nothing um you know and, and ideally not behind and i know uh, usually you want to do it outside or ideally not behind glass so a lot of modern glass is what we'll call it, what they call energy efficient mm -hmm. what that effectively means is it's going to block a lot of the infrared because mm -hmm. what we don't see infrared uh we and we perceive infrared effectively as heat so a lot of what modern windows do is they block uv and they block infrared so watching it behind glass actually is not going to be helpful that's why these glasses are not really going to be helpful most modern glasses most modern contact lenses reflect that so you're not going to get that absorption contacts are a bigger issue because you actually cut off the oxygen supply to the eye too because it creates a seal um i wore contacts for i mean i have contacts i don't wear them a ton but something worth thinking about as well uh so that would be step one enough. yeah so so that would be step one step two i would say would be to ideally get off all screens like an hour or so before bed um so again writing reading journaling board games yoga uh you know whatever you want to do, like just find an activity where you don't need that. Uh, again, if you need like a lamp or something, okay, try to keep it low. I think that's where blue, blue blockers are really useful. Uh, you could get a reading light. So like I mentioned before, like if you're reading, you could get like a small light for that. I, and ideally keep it as dim as possible. Uh, so that would be a big thing. As far as getting the sleep right, um obviously that's a big part of it another big thing i would say though is try to make your bedroom as non-native emf free as possible so um i did that at minimum i would say like if you have a wi-fi router in your house shut it off at night just unplug it you don't even need to shut it off just unplug it um well another reason the reason for that is again like 
when we sleep, we tend to be in like the theta or delta wave range. And if you look at that, that's somewhere between like four to eight hertz. When you actually look at the Schumann resonance, which is the heartbeat of the earth, it's about 7.8 hertz. I don't think it's an accident that they're about the same. But what we find in, in studies, both on humans and animals, is that if you actually put an animal, especially in, in a Faraday cage, where you're blocking off the Schumann resonance, their sleep cycles will get messed up if they don't have access to it because they're not in resonance with that. So you want to make your bedroom as close to a, a natural environment as possible, especially for sleep when we're talking about detox and repair and, and rest in general. So I would unplug any electronics, honestly, you have in your room because even if they're not on, they still emit electric fields, not magnetic fields. The current needs to be flowing for that to happen, but that can happen um, if you have your phone. So I use my phone as my alarm, but I keep it on airplane mode and I keep it as far as possible as I can in my bedroom. Um, you know, is there a minimum? The farther away the possible, it, possible the better. Uh, and that's just the inverse square law, which is basically the, the more distance you put between something that's going to emit something and you, the less intense that's going to be. And it's 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 a square, so it's not it's not linear. It's nonlinear. Um, those I, I think would be the I'd say would be the basics. Uh, now some that might be a lot for people, but oh, and and keep the room as dark as possible. That should go without saying. So blackout shades, um, you know, if you need them. Uh, if you're in a city, for sure, definitely want like blackout shades or neighbors' lights or what have you. Um, and try to keep it, you know, as quiet as quiet as possible too. So th that would be like fundamental like 101 type stuff yeah i love that and i think that's important for people to have something tangible that is doable and like you said it, it sounds really simple and for some people this might not be easy depending on their schedule or what they're struggling with now but it is definitely something that's worth putting some effort into because i think i, I totally agree with everything that you've said just about how this can negatively impact your health downstream, you know, to some extent. So it's such a, it's something that is really in the palm of our hands that we can all do, you know, it's free for the most part, those things you just mentioned, no, you don't have to go buy a red light or blue light blocking glasses. You can go outside in the morning and try to keep all your lights off after the sun goes down and anybody can, can essentially do that. Yeah, you could try. Yeah. Go. I want to touch on something that you said, though, um, about the Earth's um, kind of the hurts of the Earth and then the hurts of the body. Um, one thing that I do on a daily basis is I do grounding. And hmm. is that something that would you would suggest for people to kind of help bring the body and the Earth into a more synchronized rhythm with one another? Um, because I, I mean, my nickname is Barefoot Katie. I run around barefoot like ninety nine percent of the time. Um, so I'm shocked. Yeah, right now. I it's cold know. here. So it's, <laughs> it's cold here. But I mean, they're a barefoot shoe. But um, is that something that you find that uh, is helpful as well to kind of help balance the body with the earth? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny. I was listening to an interview with uh, Gerald Pollack, which if you haven't read his book, by the way, The Fourth Phase of Water, I highly recommend it. But he was talking to, uh, and he, by the way, just for context, he's a, he's a PhD in physics in I think the University of Washington. And he was at some conference and he was meeting with uh, like a Russian PhD and they were just having a conversation. And he writes about it, I think in his book, that... Yeah, like Russian kids in, in, you know, second and third grade, like they learn that the Earth's surface has a negative charge. Mm -hmm. I, again, I never learned that in school. Mm -hmm. uh, but, th but this is just like matter of fact, like Russian kids just learn this. I know we don't learn this here. Yeah. Uh, so, but turns out, yeah, there's a separation of charge in the ionosphere. So the, the Earth's surface is negatively charged. The ionosphere is more positively charged, and what, what creates that is actually the lightning strikes, creates that, that difference. So that's actually a transfer, that transference of electrons to the Earth's surface. What's nice is electrons, now when we talk about things like antioxidants all the time, um, you know, one of those things that, that's going, that plays a role is the electrons. The electrons are actually really what put out the fire, if you're talking about like at the chemistry level, 
they're going to put out the the H pluses. Now, now that this will be the more alkaline side. If you're talking about acid alkaline chemistry, mm-hmm. inflammation effectively is an a, a a part of the body that is that has a higher acidic load. In other words, lower pH. This would be a lower number on the pH scale. And if you look at that, that's just protons without an electron. That's your H plus. Mm-hmm. All electrons are, they bring in the negative. We know electrons are negatively charged. When bases, which you'll see OH minus, if you go back to chemistry, if you remember that, um, that's what neutralizes it. Uh, And I'm not trying to talk down to you guys on this. I'm just trying to like make this as simple as possible here. Absolutely. That's what we like. I'm not, yeah, all right, good. Uh, So I'm not, I don't mean We get what you're saying, but yes, we like the simplicity of the explanation for sure. Okay. So electrons effectively do the same thing. Now, if you remember, like we just said, the Earth's surface in and of itself has a negative charge. By just standing on it, you can ground yourself to it. I mean, again, this is where engineers and and folks in the electronic space have known this forever because they've had grounding poles and grounding wires to ground Mm -hmm. static electric charges. They've done this literally since we've had electricity to make it work so that fuse boxes don't pop and, and, and... the whole bit and it's the same thing for us so the more we're disconnected from that we're effectively building a net charge a net more positive charge if you will grounding allows us to effectively tap into a virtually unlimited supply of electrons so like in in, in one way you can theoretically make the argument that like grounding is like the ultimate antioxidant Uh uh-huh um it does get a little bit tricky though like depending on where you live uh, Correct. and that's where it gets a little bit more dicey and, and, and the effects are i don't think totally understood although there there's there's so certainly reasons. yeah so like the best surfaces like if we want to make it general here are going to be any natural surface that you can get your your feet or hands or again any any part of your skin will do this Generally, your hands and feet are going to be best because they have more sweat glands and Mm -hmm. water, as you know, conducts electricity. So it's much easier to do that on surfaces that are wet versus dry. So, you know, dirt, grass, sand, oceans. uh, So water, Mm -hmm. obviously, would be great. Um, I don't think it's an accident that humans uh, originated in tropical, probably coastal locations. Like that's not an accident. Um, so those would be the best surfaces. Uh, I run, actually, though, cement, believe it or not, actually works as a pretty decent surface to ground on. Now, there's a caveat to that, because if you have, um, like, electric underground electric wiring under that, that's going to affect your ability to ground on those surfaces. Mm-hmm. And that includes natural surfaces, too. So when we, because, again, if you have electric, an electrical current flowing, when, when you have a, so electrical fields are going to always be present, but you create an electromagnetic field with elect flow. So once you have a current flowing, now it's an EMF. So if you're having non-native EMFs right under the ground, that becomes a bit more dicey, say, if you live in like a modern smart city where a lot of, you'll notice they don't have the wires, you know, hanging on the streets, they're all underground. So that's going to affect, you're probably not going to get the same benefits you would say if you're outside in a more rural area. Um, To what degree, I don't know yet, but it seems like that's the case and that does seem to make sense. It also makes sense if you say live in like an apartment building and you're 20 stories in the air, Mm -hmm. which again, does not happen to any, anything that's not a bird or or can fly. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) there's a reason for that. So that's also going to be an issue too. And then you have to go into the context of probably being around multiple different Wi-Fi routers at all times. And, and, and we have to take it in the context of all that. But so the short answer is yes, in more modern city areas, it becomes a bit more dicey for sure. Okay. Yeah. And I really think, I mean, to come full circle with everything we talked about, it really is one of those things. If you can look at what our ancestors did, you know, versus what so many of us are doing now Mm -hmm. in modern day, you know, it's like, how can we get back to that? How can we go back to some of those more natural human things, you know, not just 
light, but, you know, spending more time in nature, being outside barefoot, all these things, you know, like you had mentioned, nobody wore clothes long time ago, probably <laughs> maybe a loincloth or something, but right. you know, we've just gotten so far from like basic human tendencies mm-hmm. and, and connection with nature. And I know in the very beginning, you had talked about just convenience culture. And I think that's, that's a big thing, but I'm so grateful for people like you and other people out there spreading this message because it is really about that simple thing of getting back closer to origins of human human humanity and reconnecting with nature like that's kind of the the cornerstone to me to to it all yeah and you know what like back in i want to say the 1800s there was kind of this it was like the late 1800s there was this kind of like there was these two camps in science where one was vitalism that, that kind of had this concept that like humans were essentially like electrical beings and, and, and that ultimately ended up falling out of favor for a long time and, and honestly still is today. But like the truth of the matter is, is us and every other being, including the trees that I'm looking at outside the window right now, like we all actually work on electronics and magnetics and it's just, we don't, we're we're getting a better understanding of that finally now because i think some we have some of the tools to kind of measure it much better than we did back then um but it's now overcoming this biochemical model where we're trying to kind of force feed everything through chemistry and chemistry i i I, what my opinion is beginning to change on this is i think chemistry is more influenced by physics and light and magnetism more so than chemistry than just brute forcing everything by over flooding the body with nutrient x or y or or a drug to do the same thing you could certainly force a reaction but the, you know what are the consequences of that and living in this kind of like modern society unfortunately doesn't make it easy so like it, it becomes an active effort to do the thing that's weird and not normal to con- con- compare to most people Right. Yeah. It's so funny that it was like natural, you know, X amount of time ago. And now it's like, we got to really put the effort into this. I know these are things just people didn't worry about or have to worry about because it just, it just didn't exist. And that was yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, this was such a good episode. I could probably talk to you for another hour at least. And I hope to have you back on for a whole nother gamut of conversation because you're just a wealth of knowledge and I just love everything that you said today because I feel like some anyone listening is going to be able to take something nugget away something. Mm-hmm. yeah they're going to find some nugget that is going to impact their life in a positive way so we thank you so so much where can people find you online if they want to kind of connect with you and see what you're sharing with the world yeah um on pretty much all social channels it's just at dr vincent esposito dr not the word doctor um and my website is inside out health wellness.com i there you can get in touch with me there um and i have all my blogs and stuff or if you want to work with me or whatever all that stuff is there um but yeah and all this stuff by the way on light and circadian rhythm like is all in much longer blog posts not all of it we're getting there but it's being built out so yeah yeah. We Perfect. will link all of Dr. Vince's information in the show notes so you guys can find him everywhere that he is. Awesome. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for joining us on this episode of Up All the Podcasts. You can find myself personally at barefoot.katie. You can find Sarah at Sarah Barron's. You can find Up All the Podcasts on all the places online. So until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and take care of the world around you. Bye, guys. Thank you Bye. so much for joining us, Dr. Vincent. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye.